Okay, today we're going to talk about a retrospective accounting change. In other words, if we make a change in accounting principle, we're supposed to go back to the beginning of time and restate our books as if that new principle had always been in effect. That's different than a change in estimates. So if we decide that our buildings are going to last 30 years instead of 20, that's a change in estimate. We just apply that going forward. But if it's a change in accounting principle, we have to go back to the beginning of time. And the problem, the challenge, the difficulty is that every intermediate accounting textbook uses the example of changing from the completed contract basis to the percentage of completion basis for accounting for long-term construction contracts. And I barely understood that when we talked about that concept on its own. Now we're going to take that very complicated notion and use it to illustrate this new complicated notion. So let's take a look at the change from completed contract to percentage of completion method and then look at uh, retrospective accounting change vis-a-vis -vis accounting principle. So we should all remember from managerial accounting that when we build something we take materials, labor, and overhead, move it into work in process, finish it, it sits in finished goods, and then when we're done with that it moves into cost of goods sold when we sell it. The thing about construction business is of course there's really no inventory of bridges we've got done or inventory of freeways we've got done, so there's really no finished goods in the construction business. So the work and process account is called construction process and the uh, cost of goods sold is called cost of construction in the construction business. And all these guys in black font, these are all balance sheet accounts. The only one that is an income statement account is this cost of goods sold, which is an expense account. So you may remember that in the completed contract method, we carry our work in process as we build the freeway, as we build the bridge, we carry it only at our cost. Then at completion, we'll take those costs and move them into cost of goods sold. So now we've got an expense account. The revenue account comes from a contra asset account we call progress billings. So as we build our customer, as we build the ILLED, build our customer, we debited accounts receivable and credited progress billings. Then at the end, when everything's done, now we finally turn that progress billings account into a revenue account and that work in process turns into our cost of goods sold account. So in the meantime, we've booked absolutely no gross profit for this long-term project. Probably a better way to go is to use the percentage of completion method. That allows us to book a certain percentage of our gross profit every year. So if in year one we do 20% of the work, we should put 20% of the gross profit on our income statement. Remember, under the completed contract basis, everything hangs out on the balance sheet and finally goes to the income statement at the end. What we're going to do is we're going to stick into this work in process account, which we call construction progress, not just our costs, but also our estimated gross profit. Well, how do we make that journal entry balance? We can't just debit work in process for, say, estimated gross profit of $100,000. Well, what we're going to do is we're also going to debit cost of goods sold for that percentage of work that we did and the revenue account for the percentage of the revenue that we earned. So big picture, the whole trick to going from the completed contract basis to the percentage of completion method is we're going to put more numbers into the work and process account. And what do we call the work and process account in the construction environment? We call it construction in process. So this uh, company starts business on January 1st, 2013, and they're taxed at the 40% tax rate. So this is what their income statement looked like, and it's also what their tax return looked like. So on their financials and their tax return, they use the same numbers, hence there is no deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. These guys decide at the beginning of 2015 that the percentage of completion method is better. We should book a little bit of gross profit as we go along. If they had done that, this is what their uh, financials would look like. This is what their income statement would look like. So they have to go back to the beginning of time and say, if we're going to change from the completed contract basis to the percentage of completion method, we're going to have to restate all our financials. But 
These years are closed, 2013 and 2014, those books are closed. So we're going to have to do some kind of catch-up here in our books in 2015. Well, what is that catch-up going to look like? Well, here we had $400,000 of uh, income before taxes, and here we would have had $600,000. So that's an extra $200,000 of gross profit that we have to book. Here we had one sixty. dollars we would have had 180, so that's another 20,000 of gross profit we should have booked. So in other words, we should have moved into construction and process that estimated gross profit, which would have been 220,000. Prior to 2015, we had income before taxes of $560,000. And if we'd been using the percentage of completion method, we would have had 780, so we need to add $220,000. And like we just talked about, that means adding that estimated gross profit into work in process, which is called construction in process. We also have to catch up retained earnings. Retained earnings is on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, so it increases with credits. So we have to increase it by the after-tax effects of that. In other words, we've got to take into account that that $220,000 would have been taxed at 40%. So we would have only had retained earnings grow by 60% of that. So we credit retained earnings for $132,000, which is the after-tax effect of that extra $220,000 in gross profit. $220,000 times 1 minus 40% or times 60% should give you this $132,000. And the difference is a deferred tax liability because on our books now, we would have had 160,000. We had 160,000 on our tax return. On our books, 240. That's a difference of 80,000. On our tax return, we would have had 64,000. Here, we would have had 72,000. That's a difference of 8,000. So this $80,000 difference between our books, excuse me, between our tax return and our books, plus this $8,000 difference between our tax return and our books, is a deferred tax liability of $88,000. And then one last complicating nuance. So this is our journal entry at the beginning of uh, January 2015. And then for our uh, financial statements, this is what our uh, financial statements are going to look like in 2015. We're just going to apply the percentage of completion method. And oddly enough, this is what our financials are going to look like now. We may have published these before, but to make things comparable, we have to go back and restate our financial statements as if that new accounting principle had always been in place. So big picture, when we make a change in accounting principle, unless it's impractical to do so, we have to go back to the beginning of time and restate all our financial statements as if that new accounting principle had been in, chase, in place all along. If it's a change in estimate, we just make it going forward. But if it's a change in principle, we have to go back to the beginning of time and restate everything. All right, I hope this helps make a very complicated thing slightly less complicated. Thanks.